Okay, it seems that I'm live. Um, I see that my screen is okay. So let's just get started and let's talk about security in Vue and Next. So as Jen already introduced me, my name is Jakob and I work at Vue Storefront as a senior developer and also developer advocate. But apart from that, I'm also an ambassador for Next, Storyblock and Algolia. And just recently, I was also named the um, Google Developer Expert at uh, Web Performance. So those are the things that, let's say, identify me. Uh, if you don't know what Vue Storefront is, basically Vue Storefront is a lightning fast front-end platform for headless commerce that can easily connect to several different uh, third-party services such as CMS, uh, payments, e-commerce platforms, and so on and so on. So after this presentation, you will be a security ninja. And I thought that it could be possible, but in reality, unfortunately, it is not possible. I have only 15 minutes uh, and basically the topic is so huge that it's not possible to share with you all the knowledge I know and the knowledge from other sources as well. So what I decided to do instead is to make you more aware of security risks in modern web applications instead but instead of showing you all the possible attacks, all the possible things that your application might fail in terms of security. So instead of that, focus on making you more aware of what you as a developer should be looking at to make your applications more secure. So I will start with the concept that I know for some time uh, already, and I always uh, use it to explain what is the web security and what you should be looking at. And it's OVASP top and it's OVASP and OVASP top ten. So OVASP top ten is a standard awareness document for do for developers and web application security. It represents a broad consensus about the most critical security risks to web applications. So if you take a closer look at the things that I have highlighted in this, in this definition, you have standard awareness document about security risks. So those are the most important aspects of OVASP. It is a document that will list all or the most popular security risks that are happening to web applications. If you go a bit uh, further, a bit further, you will see this another let's say, a definition that it is a globally recognized by developers, developers as the first step towards more secure coding. And in here, I also intentionally highlighted first step because security is similar concept as performance, as accessibility, as scalability. Those concepts, they are quite huge and they should be treated as a process instead of, uh, instead of a one or a single feature. So if you take a look at how OVASP top 10 is structured, you will see, and maybe I'll go for to the next slide because it's actually a bit more visible. You will see what are the most common security risks in modern web applications. And you also see that it changes over the time because we have some security risks as 2017 and at 2021, we have new ones, maybe some of them have moved through the list. For example, in here we see that from, let's say, uh, fifth place, broken access control moved to the first place. So in 2021, the most common issue in terms of security in web applications was actually broken access control. If we'd go to each of those um, security risks, we would see like definition, the uh, common use cases, but Apart from that, what OVASP is also giving us is the cheat, cheat sheets about Node.js, about uh, PHP. You have all those cheat sheets that help you uh, find those problems at your application. And it not, it's not only highlighting those issues, it also gives you recommendations on how you can fix them. So let's take a look at some of the security popular security risks. And let's start with the injections. So you probably heard about SQL injection and cross-site scripting. So 
SQL injection is basically when a, let's say, hacker is sending a modified request so that instead of a regular SQL select, we are uh, creating a different command, different rule. And because of that, we are getting the data that we shouldn't. So this is how the SQL injection works. In terms of cross-site scripting, it's quite similar. We are sending a code as a part of the thing that shouldn't be a code. It should be, for example, a string. And because of that, this code is stored, for example, in a database so that next users, they will get this script that will run automatically on the website. So this is one example. So we have injections. Next, we have access broken access control. So how it works is basically we have the user that goes through a normal flow. He authenticates himself or authorizes through some kind of uh, ACL, which is like the um, access control server. And in some cases, we might have users that will be able to somehow uh, miss this ACL layer and get access to the data that they shouldn't have access to. This is like the second one. And the third, which is actually my favorite, uh, is about DOS or D -D DDOS, so denial of service. So how it works is we have our application and we have other clients that are accessing our application and they are sending to so many requests to our application that our application is basically, basically cannot respond to them and just gives up. So I have one bonus case, but let me just quickly look at the time I got. So it's six minutes, so it's quite okay. I have a quite interesting bonus case for you, which was discovered last year, which is about malicious NPM packages, sometimes called also dependency confusion. And I wanted to talk about it specifically because this targets basically all of us because it's about NPM packages. And I'm sure that all of us use NPM packages. So this article, unfortunately, is in Polish. So I wasn't able to, I couldn't find a solid replacement or, or alternative in English. So I will try to summarize it to you. How it works is that uh, the hacker could publish an NPM package that looks like the other package that is uh, provided by a big company, in this case, for example, PayPal. So he created a code or a package that was published to NPM. Users were downloading those packages thinking that this is the official package. And this package, what was doing under the hood, was creating something what is called a reverse shell that allowed the hacker to have control of the user device. So because of that, that person that, that found this, this, um, this attack managed to get it's like $130,000 in a bug bounty, which is quite nice. And one last thing, as you can see at the bottom, you have PayPal, Microsoft, Apple, Spotify, Shopify, sorry, uh, Netflix, Tesla, and Uber. So they were able to create packages that were imitating that they are from those companies, so very big companies. So how can we make view apps more secure? We have very good sources on Vue.js documentation. We have sec section for best practices and security, which covers a lot uh, that I could do in my presentation if I had more time. So I will just let you know to go to this website and there will, you will have a lot of good reference there. And we also have the HTML5 security, which also outlines several things that you could do in order to make your app more secure in terms of like the front end from the Vue.js. So what about next? Uh, quick look at the time. OK, so we have still a bit of time. So what about next? Um, I wanted to talk about it a bit more uh, and to talk specifically about the next security, which is the module, module that I created for next. And what this module does is that it comes with several things that will help you make more secure applications, like more, sec more secure next applications. So if you know. Uh, Node.js, you probably also know things like uh, Helmet middleware or Course middleware that you were, you could install and it will automatically make your app a bit more secure by setting certain uh, response security headers or by just configuring Course. So 
My module comes with both of those out of the box, as well as some middlewares that will help you with the cases that I mentioned previously. Like with the injections, we have, for example, XSS validator for cross-site scripting. We also have things like rate limiting that would allow us to protect against, against the DDO, DDoS attacks. So those huge amount of requests for our application. And we also have basic auth that we can very easily enable. So um, let me go just here, so into the demo. I will show you quickly how it works. Um, we have the documentation of Next Security, which I highly recommend you to check out. And we also have the very simple Next application. If we check out the code, it only has the Next dependency in the version 3.0 uh, for now, but I will update it later. And we also have the dependency of Next Security. So if we take a look at the response headers that are set right now for the application, we see only a few of those. So what will happen if we will enable the module, the Next Security module? If we reload the server and now inspect the headers, I will also make sure to make it a bit bigger so it's better visible. We see that there is much, much more headers here. We have content security policy, we have cross-origin resource policy, and many, many more. And apart from that, what we also get is the cross-site scripting protection. So if we go, for example, and in the browser say text, and in here we will create, let's say, a script, like a JavaScript, um, like a tag in HTML for scripting, and we will say, let's say, alert one, and we will close up the script tag. What will happen is that we will get the 400 bad request because actually this shouldn't be there. This is not a proper uh, proper value that we should send to the server. This is like a security issue. But apart from that, I wanted to show you two more examples and let me see the timing. Yeah, I still have time, okay. The phone just drops. Um, if we go to get started and in here we have rate limiting. So how does this rate limiting works? For, the, for this uh, configuration that you can see below, what it will do is after 200 requests from the same IP address, it will block this IP address from sending more requests. But I won't be trying to send in 200 requests right now. What I will do instead is I will just copy it, add it to my next configuration here, and instead of 200 here, I can also remove the throw error because it's not needed. And we also will remove this one because we can also register middlewares for certain goods only. So I will keep it empty string, which will make it a global middleware. So it will work on all possible uh, routes. And in here, instead of 200 tokens or requests, I will just say two. The application will reload. And what will happen right now is that when I will access the home page for the first time, it's OK. If I uh, request it once more, it's still OK. But if I try to make it more, you will see too many requests because I try to go to the page too many times. And one last thing I wanted to show you is the basic of. So if we go here and copy this configuration and put it instead of the rate limiter. Here, what we will do is we will also get rid of the root. We want to make it a global middleware and we'll refresh the page. And once we will try to access our home page, what we will see instead is we will see this basic authentication from the browser that we need to know the username and the password to access the website. And as it was set to test and test like this, I can now access the website freely. Let's go back to the presentation. So if you liked the module itself, how it works and what it can do for you, I highly recommend you to give it a star on GitHub. And I have one important or interesting news as well regarding next security. If you've been following Twitter for some time already uh, or, or for just a few weeks already, um, you know that there is a thing called Elk, which is a client built with Next3 uh, on top of the Mastodon, which is, let's say, becoming a Twitter alternative. 
So Elk is actually using Nux security for all the for security functionality. So I'm pretty proud of it. And yeah, if you can, please give it a star as well. And also, if you find some other security risks and issues that are not covered with this module, make sure to uh, add, the, add it in the issues. I'm adding constantly new security improvements so that users can freely just install the module and yeah, basically make more safe, secure applications. And that will be it from my side. I think that I managed to get just in time. Uh, so thank you very much for being with me here. If you'd like to reach me, uh, make sure to check out with check it out with uh, at Jacob Androwski. I music it for Twitter, YouTube, and DevTube, where I'm posting weekly. There is only one difference on GitHub, where I am named actually Barosham. Uh, yeah, that's it. Thanks. And I think we go to Q&A. You got it. We definitely do. And thank you again, Jakob. Big question. What operating system? Um, I'm using Mac OS for some time, but I was using Windows for my whole life, let's say. I'm using Mac OS for about two years or three years, okay. so not, not too much, uh, but instantly uh, loved it. So. I think I'm staying here. I'm here to stay. <laughs> nice, nice. I have about an hour left on the poll that I'm doing, and Mac OS was below 50%, but it's back above at 51%. Uh, Windows is at 23.7, and Linux is at 24.7. So yeah. Mac is still winning, and I'm pretty excited about that. It's one of my favorite platforms, but more about security. When is the right time to consider security in your application? I would say the same case as with performance. So the earlier, the better. So I would say that you, it should be a process from the very beginning. And it can be done by using, for example, the module that I showed you, but also by using other modules and applications that will help you do it as well. If you go, for example, to my uh, to the documentation of the module that I created, there is also a section called Good Practices. And inside of it, you will see, for example, the link for the um, linter configuration that will check your project for security, uh, security risks. So just to sum up, I would say that this is a process that should be in your application from the very beginning, like figuring out uh, that you have a security risk like broken access control right after deploying your app to production is like too late. So the area, the better. <laughs> I get that. And uh, you mentioned about the performance as well, but what uh, performance, if there are any gotchas when working with these plugins and uh, modals? Mm -hmm. Uh, I guess that it's related to the, the, the module that I shown. So um, because like all those packages or functionalities or middlewares that will help you make more secure applications might be bad for, bad for performance because basically they are middlewares. So they are run on each route. So even if you don't need it, it will run anyway, just to check whether the user is like the proper user that should get, the, should be redirected to it. So I wouldn't say that it's a big performance issue, but for applications that care really much about like to mitigate or to eliminate all the code possible that is not needed, maybe this is not a perfect go with, with those modules because modules and plugins, they are run almost any time, like on the root change, on the... Um, some other lifecycle methods in, in Vue and Next. So I would say that you should be using them, but proper configuration of them, like on which routes they should be run, is essential if you want to, to make it more performant. In my default configuration, what I'm doing is that I'm just applying it everywhere, but it is a default configuration. You can configure it the way you want. All right, thank you. Uh, this is a good one. Of is there any easy way to handle CSRF 
see if I can get my my letters today, tokens in Nuxt. Um, yeah, there's actually a package called Nuxt-CSurf, uh, surf, something like this, uh, which covers that. And it was released like five days ago, I think. And I also contacted the author of this package because I wanted to implement C CSRF inside of Nux security as a part of one of the functionalities of the module. So I already contacted the package author so that maybe we can collaborate together and, and add it to Nux security as well. But this is not yet uh, released. I'm just starting to work on it to, to release it in the next version of the Nux security module. So for now, you can use this next uh, C surf for sure. Thank you. I checked you. it out and it works. Yay. <laughs> uh, and what are some good uh, solutions for preventing spam with Nuxt? Is there an official honeypot or captcha, uh, recaptcha uh, module? I, I think there is a module for recaptcha, uh, but I'm not sure whether it works with Nuxt free. Um, I think it's in the Nuxt community organization of Nuxt. Um, and yeah, so there is that for sure that you can use. I don't know about honeypot. All right, thank you. And what do you think about sync? Uh, the sync extension, is that how you say it? Snick. Snick. It's Snick. like sneaky, being sneaky. <laughs> okay, sneak. <laughs> the sneak extension helps me uh, avoid a lot to avoid unsafe code and problematic packages. Yeah, that's a good recommendation. Uh, I have it in the good practices of the documentation of Nux security module. This is a great tool that works for both like static code analysis and it also has a dashboard where it is uh, prompting you to um, to update your packages. It works similar to similarly to Dependabot, but it tackles more about security itself because Dependabot is also about updating packages. As a sneak, it's primarily about the security aspect. So I'm using it on my projects, and I would de de I, de I definitely recommend you to use it as well. So in my documentation, you will also see the, the links for, for using that. Thank you. And last question of, uh, I wonder if the memory can overflow if too many requests are captured by the rate limiter. So basically the issue with rate limiting is that you can't really develop them efficiently if you want to have them as a next module. Because how it works right now is that it is storing those um, requests or the IP addresses, it is storing it in the memory cache. So what it means is that it's basically, if there will be like million requests, it will um, populate the memory cache, but it shouldn't break your application. So in a real life example, what you should do instead is not uh, to use my module, th this middleware for, for uh, rate limiting, because in a real life example, you should have a separate tool, for example, fail to ban, that allows you to stop the requests uh, faster because the, the rate limiting middleware in my module, it's on the, let's say, application layer, while things like fail to ban works on the infrastructure layer, which is before your application. So it's you can faster detect the requests and ban them. So I would say that for huge applications, the default rate limiting is uh, shouldn't be used because it won't be efficient enough. And it is also what was done for the Elk. Uh, you will see that Elk is using all my uh, middlewares except for the rate limiting. Because rate limiting is actually delivered by Cloud Cloudflare, which is used for um, for hosting the Elk uh, application. So for the real life examples like production ready and uh, maybe not production ready, but those uh, websites with very big traffic, you should be using separate service for rate limiting. But I am delivering this functionality as a part of the security module for those smaller applications that might benefit from functional default functionality like that. 
Great. Thank you. And I, I am glad that we were able to dig in more about security overall, because that is such an important topic. And y'all go follow Jakob on the Twitters. And he shared earlier all of how to link up on social media. Anything uh, you want to share before you leave us for the day? Um, just try to make more safer applications, more secure. <laughs> That's it. I like and it. And I will be happy. <laughs> I like it. I like it. Thank you again for joining us.